All right, everyone. Um, welcome. Uh, today I'm going to be talking to you about a tool that I've been working on called Plinko, which uh, effectively does third-party test coverage and identification. Um, I'm not sure if you guys can see the title, uh, the subtitle. Yeah, it's kind of like the game, and we'll get there. Um, and this is one of the ones that has a patent pending. So hopefully it works. OK, so problems. Um, a lot of this is talking about the manual stuff, because there's still a lot of manual stuff that we do in our jobs. Um, some of those is you know, determining exactly what a feature um, is covered by you know all your tests is a long process, tedious process, and it's currently done uh, basically manually. You go through your tests, check each one, maybe like how you want to document it, figure out which one each test is covering, and then go down the line for your feature. Um, this takes a lot of time, and you shouldn't be doing that. Um, also, running all your tests is most likely wasting time and resources. So while John can help us to um, reduce the amount of time it takes to run a test by paralyzing things. We can also do other things to reduce the amount, of time, the amount of tests that we really need to run. This is especially true in ZStream. Um, additionally, many tests consist entirely of functionality that is covered by other tests. Um, I'm not saying most tests, hopefully not most tests within your framework, but there's a lot of tests um, that if you're just looking for you know, a quick check on functionality, they are covered by a number of other tests. I'm not sure how you guys do it, but with us, we have things that are like, you know, create an activation key with this kind of name, create an activation key with a name that's slightly longer, or some other weird variations. If you're just trying to do a check of what functionality is actually working, those aren't all needed. Um, and identifying those tests is even more daunting because you have to figure out which ones are actually covered by what. And that includes going through the entire product, especially if you have integration tests or you know, two, tier three, tier four. Um, so that's where Plinko comes in. Um, it uses product information from tools like APX and CLX, which I demoed uh, last year at QE Camp. I'm not sure how many people were here. Uh, basically, what those do is it allows you to explore an API and a CLI, uh, basically scrape all the information about it, basically pulling everything from your features, um, all the different paths if it has to do with the API, and all the different um, subcommands if it has to do with the CLI. Basically, it puts that all in one document, so it's easy to go through. Um, you can do all, some other cool things with it as well, but I'm not going to delve back into that. Um, my initial approach was flawed, and we'll get into that. Um, it, was, it was fast, um, but it relies on using perfect naming, and we'll get into that, I think, in the next slide as well. Um, however, the newest implementation took significantly longer to work on, and it's significantly more accurate, and you'll see why. Um, basically, uses deep inspection to find uh, true code coverage. Uh, currently, it only works for Python. Um, it is a Python-based tool, so doing these kind of things within Python itself is significantly easier, but there should be ways to make uh, plugins for different languages as well, depending on what you guys run your test. We basically do everything in Python, so that's what I focus on. Um, it can also generate uh, a number of different reports. Um, you can generate reports for missing coverage, so um, if you have you know, an old feature, a brand new feature, you can run this and figure out exactly where you're missing coverage. So you may be missing you know, certain items for a particular feature. Again, like activation keys, I'm going to go ahead and keep picking on that because it's highest alphabetically for satellite. Um, you can also use this for identifying test pruning candidates. So we've got thousands of them on thousands of tests. And if we can identify tests that really aren't, there, aren't necessary, um, then we can use this to identify which ones we can just drip, take out of the process. Um, it also can do other things, um, and I'll show this a bit more later, like identifying the minimum amount of tests that you need to run that covers all of the feature coverage for your entire repository, which I think is most helpful. All right, so this is Plinko Classic. Um, it is naive, uh, very trusting of you, and definitely shallow. 
Uh, basically what it does is it will look through the reports that APX and CLX would generate, uh, find all the different entities and all the different methods that are part of your API or CLI, and then just look at the test name. So you guys might be able to see some problems here. Within this one test, it's a very simple test, test name says that it's going to create an activation key. Basically, it used context, so you're in the activation key file, and you're doing test positive create. But there's two other things in this test that it's now missing out on. It's missing out on calls to the info method, uh, to the update method. So this is falsely identifying this test as only covering one thing. And unless you use really, really long test names, this method isn't going to work. So if any of you watch Raymond Hedegger's talk, there must be a better way. Um, this is what that looked like. Uh, we have the APIX. Um, well, that, that's actually our CLX report for part of what Hammer is on the top left. And then we have the PyTest output on the top right. And then I'm out of there. So we have um, tests that match those particular um, parts there, and then the missing coverage reports are there on the bottom right of the screen. I'm trying to keep myself oriented with the room. Um, obviously, uh, some of that's probably valid. Hopefully, most of it isn't just because it's so shallow. So this comes in with uh, what I initially called Plinko Deep, and I'm staying with it now. It is the next generation or the current generation, um, however you want to think about it. And yes, it looks exactly like that. Um, so it's much less trusting. It doesn't care what you name the test. It's going to go ahead and read through the entire test uh, statement by statement anyway. Um, it goes ahead and it tracks any instances or aliases to entities that you may have created along the way. So if you're using a framework that is object-oriented um, and you instance uh, one of those objects, it'll keep track of that. So you don't have to worry about it not losing um, coverage based on things like that. Um, it also investigates unknown method calls, which we'll get again into later. And that's actually um, pretty neat, as well as dynamically and recursively imports external dependencies. How? All right, so this is kind of, um, obviously it doesn't do highlighting, this is just for a presentation. Um, this is, um, I think the same exact test, and I put some highlighting on the slide there. The green stuff is what it identifies as actual coverage. The yellow is if it tracks any type of aliases or known names. So we see up the top there, we have activation key being set to an instance actually a method under self called make activation key. Um, how this is actually doing that is it is finding the code for make activation key and dynamically uh, parsing through that code uh, the same the way that we would parse through um, this code as well. And that uses uh, Python's abstract syntax trees to go through every single statement. Um, and as it goes, it maintains a knowledge base of, uh, of determined coverage for each one, so as it goes through those things like make, make activation key, if it touches anything else, like potentially creating an organization or something like that, it'll also attach the coverage for that as well. So as it goes on, it keeps compiling a bigger and bigger knowledge base of each method that your code uh, touches in your repository. Uh, so yeah. Um, we increase the coverage found in this test from just one thing, which is activation key create, to now uh, create, info, update, and if I'm, I'm sure if I dug into make activation key, we'd probably hit organization and stuff. So significantly better. All right, so um, this is another version of a test. Uh, here we're using a lot more object-oriented methods. I believe this is our API. Yes, that's correct. So we do a number of instances here, and those instances also call methods. And a lot of this is nested and very complicated. None of this is captured basically in the test name itself, except for one particular thing. Um, so as it's going along, it you know inspects each call, goes down into each call, 
and uh, tracks the coverage from there. So in here, we're determining the coverage to be activation keys, create, update. We're also hitting uh, host collections create method, as well as the organizations create method. And if you guys have any questions on this, uh, you can feel free to shout out at any time. Um, I'll try to leave some time for questions at the end as well. Um, I'm talking a bit fast, so we'll probably have a little bit of time as well. So cool. All right, still going on how it does it. <laughs> um, so it also holds a record of all imports in a file. Um, this is important because depending on how your framework is structured, you're going to do a lot of code sharing. Um, not all of that is going to be relevant, though. So if you look at the top there, we only have one import that actually adds coverage. Um, and if you look at the bottom there, these are CLI-based tests. We do a lot of importing and sharing of uh, different tools and libraries. Uh, almost all of those are providing coverage. So as it's going along, um, if it hits something like um, enable Red Hat repo and fetch ID, um, going by that name, unless you have some really interesting um, natural language processing going on, you're going to have no idea what that's, that's going to do. So it actually uses um, Python's import lib and Yeah, import lib and inspect to basically find the location of that exact file on your file system and then use inspect to load the code itself and then parse that all through, do the same exact process. And as that goes along, it's going to be searching for the exact same stuff and eventually report any coverage from each of those when it's called. Um, I did a bit of time saving in here. So uh, the import manager class itself keeps track of anything that has previously been called, so we don't have to do this every single time, otherwise it would take forever. Um, so if it's something that it already knows about, it's going to report that back. If not, then it's going to go ahead and dynamically do that. Um, one thing that it will skip every single time is anything that's part of the standard library, because your project is probably not part of the standard library. No offense, I'm just saying. Um, and this is why max depth is important, which is one of the arguments for Plinko. Um, I recommend somewhere between 5 and 10 as max depth. And what I mean by max depth is as you go along and you hit something like uh, make host collection, and it's going through there, and it finds another method that it doesn't know, it's going to go recursively into that. So now you're on to the second level. If you find something there, you're on the third level. And it can keep going and going and going throughout the entire file until eventually your um, system runs out of either CPU or memory resources, or Red Hat's no longer a company. Who knows? Um, so yeah, set the max depth. That way, when it hits that max depth, it'll rewind and report back anything it knows. Most likely, by the time it gets to the point of that max depth, you're going to be outside of the things you control anyway. So I recommend someone between 5 to 10 if you All right, so with that said, calm down a little bit. Um, so some requirements and challenges. As I mentioned before, it requires um, you to have APIX or CLX already, um, I wouldn't say integrated into your product, um, but have you know, parsers for those. Uh, they're fairly easy to write for the API and CLI. If you guys need help with that, um, hit me up. I'm more than happy. Uh, to bring you into that. Um, both of those are Shark Tank initiatives as well, so if you want to participate in that, um, I definitely welcome you guys uh, to bring it into your team because those tools are amazing as well. And if you want to know more about them, uh, let me know after the talk and I can talk you off for a long time. Um, you also need consistent entity naming conventions. So this still relies on naming. Um, this is all static code, so it's not actually analyzing what you're hitting through the API as you're running the test. It's basically going through text files or actual text dynamically loaded as it goes through each file. Um, so if you're writing a class for uh, satellite's activation key, call it something similar to activation key. Don't call it um, Mike's awesome class. 
I mean, it might be Mike's awesome class, but just call it activation key or something similar. Um, same thing with the methods. If you're creating activation key, say activation key with a method of create instead of activation key with a method of go or something weird. Um, there's some configuration you can do to kind of normalize on how you name things. Um, so you don't have to say strictly to, you know, it says activation key in the API, so it has to be activation key. It can be activation keys, uh, different types of casing, however you want to do it. Um, you also need to install all test repo dependencies on what Plinko is running in, because as I said, it will dynamically try to import those dependencies, and if they're not installed um, where Plinko can access them, then obviously it can't import that. So you're going to get an error. Well, technically a warning. Don't worry. Um, challenges. Uh, so there's a number of challenges that I incurred, uh, encountered as I was going through that. Um, understanding tests is difficult. My initial implementation of trying to do um, the deep version was just straight up writing a number of uh, string parsers line by line and trying to go um, and put everything together. But as you can tell with uh, some of our tests up here, no, it's not as bad. Uh, there's a lot of nesting in here, and that takes a lot, um, a lot of time to come up with every single scenario. But thankfully, uh, Python has an abstract syntax tree parser, which makes it significantly easier to deal with. Still difficult if you've never done anything with ASTs, but it's significantly easier. Um, first party imports are iffy, but getting better. What I mean by that is with our CLI. Here we go. We have a number of things um, that say, you know, make activation key, make content view. Um, sometimes those are relative imports. Um, sometimes they are technically absolute within the project. Um, having a little bit of problem with that, but now that I've got someone else to help me work on it finally after a while. Um, we're nailing down uh, what I think is responsible for those type of issues. So it is missing a bit of coverage with that, but it's getting better every day. Actually, I made a pull request last night to take care of some of that, which is really awesome. Um, right now, it's non, uh, it's not available for Python or non-Python test repositories. Um, I think it's going to be more likely possible with things like Ruby to integrate with this. Um, or other type of, you know, higher level scripting languages. If you write everything in C, um, first, I don't know what you're doing. That's kind of crazy. Um, assembly, just give up. Um, I don't, just move on. Um, but yeah, if it's something like uh, Ruby or Rust or some other type of higher level language, I'm sure there's a way that we can do it. Just let me know and I'll do a bunch of research and see where we can go with it. Um, and then the final challenge is adoption. So um, I think this can be extremely valuable, but it takes people actually using it to make it valuable. Um, and that's where you guys come in. If you wanted to try, some, try this out, again, it's completely free. It's open source. It might require a little bit of your time, but most of the work has already been done. Um, you can already benefit from having APIX and CLX, uh, just a quick plug again, you can dynamically generate uh, interaction libraries with those using templates, so you don't have to maintain your own interaction libraries anymore. Um, I've recently submitted three tiers for the API version, which are pretty nice. Shot, let me know. Um, and right now, Plinko cannot be used for UI-based tests because there is no UI. Um, there's some promising things that are happening um, that Pete Savage is helping to head up with standardizing, you know, how we do things with Patternfly that might make it possible to do a UIX. And if um, that gets done, um, I'd love to jump in with someone uh, that's willing to take on uh, UI-based um, automation stuff like that. Uh, maybe parsing, how, parsing Patternfly. <laughs> has a lot of experience with uh, UI type stuff like that. Uh, so yeah, anybody, anybody really, um, let me know. 
in the end. All right, so um, similar to before, this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, again, we still have the, um, this is the CLX report. Uh, this is actually the compact version, which is a bit more human readable. And then on the top right, we have a test repository. This is Robotello, or at least a subchunk of Robotello. Um, it runs through the Plinko analysis, and then we have our test coverage report on the bottom left. So we have test uh, audit.py, um, audit test case, test positive create by type, and it covers all of these things. So I think it actually keeps going on, but I had to cut it off because the slide only so tall. Um, in the center, you can see what I call the min test max coverage. So this will uh, group things, uh, group tests by, you know, who covers the most. And then as it goes on, it's going to figure out, you know, this may cover things, but that's already been covered by test above. So you can go ahead and skip it and eventually make its way to the bottom where you have the minimum amount of tests that cover every single thing that your test repository covers. Um, I think this is really valuable for Z stream, so you can cut, um, something like 4,000 plus tests for Robotello um, to likely less than 100 and still cover everything you normally would cover, just probably not with all those weird edge cases. And then finally, a missing coverage report. Um, this is the same as before. Um, this would tell you where you need to focus on writing tests so you can get 100% feature coverage for your, um, for your product. I don't know if I actually explained that. That's why I call it third party uh, code coverage is that um, with traditional code coverage, you have um, you know, the code coverage report running in the same repository so it's access to the source code. We don't really have that since we're using third party test uh, repositories like Robotello and Satellite. So it gets the information, analyzes Robotello, puts the two together, and now you have your I'm running short on time. God, I wasn't talking fast enough. I thought I was. Um, how can this fit into an automation pipeline really easily? Um, this is something that we've, um, we're actually getting integrated now. Had our pull request finally submitted with the new version of uh, Jenkins, whatever that's using. I don't like it. Um, so yeah, you would receive the product snapped, install the product, do your APIX Explore or CLX Explore, pop that over to Plinko. It'll generate its reports. And then you can use that to either drive your automated tests or you can send those reports out via by email. Um, so if you have Nagger scripts that say, you know, these particular features um, are missing this coverage, they can be sent out to the right person or the entire team and shame people. Don't shame people. But you should probably shame people. Um, all right. Uh, here's a, a demo. Again, running short on time, so I'll probably cut out some of this. I put it in debug mode because it's more impressive. So you can actually see all that's going on underneath the hood. Here I'm doing the API diff, and the test directory is, you know, Robotel test form and API. It's using clicks, so if you miss something that it needs, it's going to go ahead and prompt you for it. And then, uh, yeah, name it Robotello. And off we go. This is, again, debug mode, so you can see all the other things it's doing. Uh, if we were to uh, pause real quickly, here we go. So this is kind of what it sees. Um, here's some of the code up the top that it's found. Uh, it found some interest, like we've got method calls, get, uh, get bug data, all this other stuff uh, that's going on. It's eventually going to pair that up with known entities and keep going. <laughs> So yeah, since this is uh, in debug mode and has a lot more output, this uh, is actually going to take a while. So I'll go ahead and skip basically to the end. Stop there. So cool. Yeah, it'll save the test to a particular uh, directory based on the naming. Um, here we have projects, hammer, CLI, test imports. Uh, that's kind of using a few aliases. Since I just said Robotello and CLI, it knows that it's hammer and goes from there. All right. So with that, how can I contribute? Um, if your project meets all the requirements that I uh, said before, then you can use it uh, basically straight away while we're working out the remaining kinks that all the complete coverage identified. Um, otherwise, you can create a parser for APIX and CLIX. Um, if that's the case and your uh, repository is in Python, 
and you can use it. And I'll help with the parsers. Um, we'll go from there. And if you're a Python pro, or um, when we get into UIX, then let me know. <laughs> but seriously, if you're into Python, you know about app sections and text trees um, and things like this, or want to learn and can spin up really quickly, uh, contact me. So, yeah. I think we got a minute and 40 seconds. Questions? Sorry, that was a bit of a breeze. Yeah. Yeah, that mic works. You have to turn it on or unmute it. And now it's not muted. Yeah, just uh, okay, so uh, Mike Driver, CFMEQE. Um, yeah. <laughs> my uh, question would be, uh, one, does this pick up in its uh, parsing of your method calls, mm -hmm. uh, instances where you have abstract method calls, and that is I have, I'm getting an attribute of a class and calling that. It doesn't look like a traditional function call necessarily. If you're, if you're calling anything, it should be able to find out where that's coming from and where it's, it's resolving. Being. Okay. And that's uh, an interesting case that if you have an example of, I can always parse it. Uh, pass it in and see what happens. Yeah, and see. Uh, no, it's something that's not used heavily, but it's there. Yeah. Um, the other uh, question I had was, it, it also seems like this is uh, something we could use to not only get coverage for the application by running APIX or CLIX against the mm -hmm. application, but actually our own testing frameworks, that we could generate reports for our test frameworks and make sure that we are actually covering all of the me methods that we've implemented for our entities. I get what you mean, yeah. As, I mean, is that ever something that, um, that you've tried to, to use this for or, or explored with? Well, since it, as long as your framework implements all of the methods that are part of your project, uh, which it may or may not, then it will identify those. So if you've implemented a method and you're not actually calling it in your test framework, then it'll key up on that. Or if you haven't implemented a method and you obviously can't call it in your test framework, then it's going to key up on that as well. Yeah. Yeah, for that, it could potentially do it, but I'm thinking that traditional code coverage might work better. I mean, worth a shot. I'm willing to try. All right, any other questions? What's that? Yes. Kirsten has a mic, yeah. All right, so this is gonna be a, a plug, shameless plug. So the premise here is that we wanna get in the business of doing continuous delivery, right? So we want to do more releases, Faster. And talking to other teams, uh, how many tests are we up to on satellite? Like 4,000, is that something like that? At least somewhere. Else, Some, yeah. yeah. So the premise is that you know you want to do a Z stream, and the assumption is that because it's a Z stream, the delta, the change between yep. what was released before and what's about to be released, it's kind of small. That you don't necessarily need to run 4,000 automated tests just to get the type of coverage that you need to do the release. So by using this tool. We want to identify only what needs to be executed. And it doesn't have to be like full coverage. It could be just what has changed since last time we tested this and run that subtest. Uh, and therefore, the idea being that you want to shorten the time that it takes to do a release. Thank so, yeah, just a plug. So, please, uh, if you are interested, talk to Jake. Help us out. Yeah, exactly. And um, the diff between different releases is something that I talked about last year is what APX and CLX can do is give you what has changed between particular releases um, of your product, things that have been added, changed, or removed. And if you run Plinko against the diff version, um, it's just going to look for those particular things. So any test that hit those, you can identify as well. Yes? Interesting. So, yeah, this looks interesting. So is there a way we can integrate some of our satellite performance tests with this flow? And it can run through your CI pipeline? Um, I'd have uh, to look at your testing framework, um, particularly the libraries that you use and how you name things, but potentially, yeah. If you use things like Nailgun or things like that, then yeah, it shouldn't be a problem at all. 
Yeah, we use advanceable plugins. It's a sad pop plugin. We don't use nail gun, yeah. Okay. Let me know. <laughs> Thanks.